I am um, the co-chair of the eHealth Working Group. Uh, firstly, just want to thank uh, Giancarlo Comi and the uh, Executive Committee, Paolo and Patrick, who've been our uh, constant uh, companions in our working group uh, for the confidence they've had in us to drive advances in understanding of e-health opportunities for PROMS. Uh, our aim is to explore the arena of e-health tools with active, passive, and questionnaires um, towards uh, bringing the voice of the patient to research and care. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce my partner in crime, my co-chair and uh, constant partner in this, uh, with our working group who I'd like to extend our thanks to. Um, Letitia is an associate professor in neurology uh, at the University of uh, Vita Salute in um, San Raffaele in Milan. Uh, President-elect of the Italian Society of Neuro, uh, Clinical Neurophysiology and Vice-Chair of the Medical Device EMA Expert Panel Subgroup for the Central and Peripheral Nervous System. system. Uh, Letitia is going to give an overview of our current status, where we are with our working group. Thank you, Letitia. Thank you so much. I join you in being grateful for this opportunity to work together for a few years now and also to be able to spread the word uh, here, which I think is very important. Dissemination is the key. And uh, I have to say uh, that uh, since uh, my university years, I have a bias in uh, medical uh, devices. And, and so this is, uh, I mean, I really like this uh, this type of uh, uh, development that technology is allowing us. And we have to say that COVID has uh, pushed forward the movement towards the um, digitalization of uh, PROMS and our, uh, of outcomes in general. And in this uh, review, uh, in Nature Reviews, uh, it is proposed that uh, from an EU regulatory perspective, digital health technologies should be used in uh, clinical trials for CNS. And uh, I have to say that um, I'm grateful for, um, to Gianpaolo for providing me with this uh, slide from uh, his paper with Paola Zalatin, suggesting that uh, digital outcomes could be useful not only in clinical trials, but in, uh, in the patient-based care helping to put them at the center, uh, allowing them uh, not only to provide uh, outcomes and uh, questionnaire more easily, but also to collect uh, passive measures. Of course, we've been speaking also this morning about the possibility, about many um, drawbacks to overcome, like uh, stigma, improving of adherence, we need to gamify to improve uh, uh, also design of of uh, objects, but also to find a way to properly analyze the data and, of course, as Helena keeps saying, to validate those. But um, concerning EMA, I came back um, uh, two days ago from the um, coordination panel of medical devices at EMA, where I am vice chair of the um, central and peripheral nervous system uh, uh, devices. Of course, I, I'm calling to action for invasive devices, but at least something is moving because uh, in the new medical device regulation, it is um, considered that uh, the expert panels, so us who have to judge the devices, are allowed and invited to speak to people with the disease involved uh, to get their opinion for the um, judgment on the work of the notified bodies. Uh, for new devices. Of course, this is for the invasive ones, but uh, things are moving, and so I hope uh, this will also, something that will apply also for, uh, you know, non-invasive devices that already have a big space in many diseases already. Think about sensors for diabetes. They are almost routine now, and I think they increase inclusion and not um, reduce inclusion because they allow uh, frequent monitoring and not having to go running around into pharmacies to buy the right strip for the right uh, device. 
And so that applies also to other fields. Think about cardiology, where atrial fibrillation is detected by FDA-approved uh, devices, and so on. And so this could really empower people with the disease to perform their own self-management. And so we know that. And um, in people with MS, things are also moving, thanks to academia and uh, together with the effort by tech companies and now also drug companies who have many of them developed their digital branch. This is from uh, academia showing that uh, sensors could be more sensitive than our EDSS, which by the way is not so sensitive and maybe not so specific for MS if we think about it. And um, in people with stable EDSS over one year, even just the average daily step count is more sensitive to change than the EDSS, which I said was stable. And that was over one year, so it could detect silent progression. We saw the example this morning for those who were following the uh, MS Data Alliance, the example from Radar CNS, where the sensors were also coupled with apps, allowing people to express their opinions and uh, provide uh, their uh, symptoms uh, description. And um, with this in mind, uh, we had to um, meet uh, several times with uh, um, the uh, e-health uh, group that I have the joy to coordinate with Rob, but I also have the joy to share with um, really many different um, types of experts, from uh, tech experts to IT to, um, of course, people with MS who give their opinion on what is valuable to them. And as I say, uh, drug companies are also deeply involved uh, in this, and um, actually I have to say that the, in these meetings, the main uh, objective is to help uh, people, no matter what our, our uh, background was. And so this was a really uh, um, ethically very, very uh, satisfying, at least personally. Uh, but we realized we couldn't start from any point because we were keeping discussing without identifying a major, um, a major uh, function that would be worth uh, starting uh, to uh, validate and promote uh, for further exploration and, as Elena said, for um, regulatory uh, procedures. And so we decided all together, again, to perform a landscape analysis to really get a view of what is available. And I have to say that the idea to perform a landscape analysis came from people with MS who said, how would you ask us for an opinion of, on digital technologies if we don't know what is around? So we actually started this uh, because of them, because they asked for it. And so also the idea of performing a landscape analysis is promoted by the people with MS, not only the method. For the method, I have to say, we couldn't do anything without Lisbeth Peters and the uh, MS uh, um, Alliance. And uh, also I have to uh, thank uh, um, Marcus de Souza for uh, also helping uh, uh, core, uh, some core decisions on really how to phrase uh, the questionnaire to be sent not only to uh, tech companies, but also to um, academia and uh, uh, drug companies who are developing their own tools. So if you um, check the PROMS website, we have a dedicated page uh, to the catalog that we are developing together with the MS Data Alliance. And um, I have to say, for people worried about the data property and also um, patented uh, technology, that we are only asking through uh, the format of a survey to describe what are the domains addressed, if, uh, what is the type of uh, uh, source uh, used, uh, and what is the, um, the institution of the lead developer of the tool, so whether it is academic or non-profit organizations, and uh, whether the device is uh, um, available for research or already for clinical uh, applications. So, I just extracted a few screenshots of the survey that took a, a really a long time to discuss and define. So, of course, the questionnaire is not validated itself. It's a, a way of collecting the information. 
But this is not actually the real product. The product would be the possibility to create a living catalog that uh, anybody can access and also contribute to um, by, um, by keeping it online and uh, working on it as long as the new information is coming. And the final uh, goal is to use the living catalog to extract and analyze together with the people with MS what are the domains and features that they are more inter most interested on for starting uh, um, regulatory procedures besides the scientific validation. So this is the QR code to get the invitation letter that again is not only dedicated to vendors but also to academia, non-profit organizations. And so uh, with this, uh, I really uh, thank you for your attention and I look forward to receiving many, many surveys. Thank you. Thank you, Letitia. <clears throat> now I'd like to welcome um, Rachel um, Paolucci, uh, who's going to give us uh, a project showcase uh, using uh, technologies we hope will help our work. Um, Rachel is, uh, has been working for the Italian MS Society um, since uh, 2019, is a travel consultant uh, professional and uh, in accessible tourism department. Um, being a person with multiple sclerosis, Rachel is also directly and concretely involved in the Italian MS Society research. We're really looking forward to your talk. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for your introduction and thank you also for inviting me to this prestigious event which is, um, I, can, I can say, patient-centered but also patient driven, so I'm very proud to be here today. Um, Alameda is a European project founded by the program Horizon 2020. It started in January 2021 and the consortium is made of 15 partners from eight uh, different countries in, in Europe, of course. Alameda's vision is to develop a prototype of, uh, for a personalized AI healthcare support system for people with brain disease, and in particular uh, for Parkinson, multiple sclerosis, and stroke. The project model are, is built upon lifestyle retrospective data, as well as new, uh, new streams of patient data, and through the monitoring of everyday uh, activities. But the project is also, and in particular, built upon the previous experience gathered in the multi-act project, and that is why I'm here today. Um, because the, the, the object is to develop a new path of participatory and anticipatory governance. And Alameda recognizes the centrality of the experiential knowledge of the patients uh, uh, through the selection uh, of the most suitable technological solutions. For use case number two, which is the one related to multiple sclerosis, the key research question is how to improve the capacity to predict relapse risk in MS. So the goal of this use case is to test artificial intelligent algorithm able to predict the risk of developing a relapse in MS. So 20 patients uh, with MS have been asked to wear a smartwatch and to use different smart devices uh, during the case study. In particular, through um, an application, a virtual assistant will ask daily simple questions to these patients. And in order to, and of course, they were, in order to collect the possible changes that occur in the different domains of mood, mobility, and cognitive functions. Um, other devices are um, sensors which are inserted in, in the belt, for example, or under the mattresses uh, of the bed. Um, through this monitoring, uh, we intend to verify if there are particular mutations that precede the clinical relapse. And if it is verified, we will have a tool to intervene in an early stage of, of the disease. 
Uh, the project also introduces a shared decision uh, model, decision making model between medical professionals, uh, but also patients and caregivers. And the engagement strategies here is very ambitious. Uh, it goes beyond the mere consultation and um, have all these people on board as design partners. Uh, so following multi-art guidelines and part principles, the very first stage, as you have seen also from the previous presentations, is to create and uh, to establish an engagement coordination team, and I'm part of the ECT for Alameda. After that, there is the constitution of the local community groups, and those groups will secure the engagement at national uh, but also at the disease specific level and provide valuable feedback as the research uh, goes on and progresses. In uh, September 2021, the Alameda Engagement Coordination Team started the activities and the aim is to capture the, the patient's uh, experiential knowledge to implement, implement um, an engagement strategy, but also to moderate the dialogue between interdisciplinary and different voices. So how did we gather, listen to, and empower patients' voices? Well, specific focus groups have been conducted to capture people um, uh, with MS perspective on relevant domains, but also, and in particular, the local group uh, validated all the specific questions which are now submitted to the patients, and we, uh, we went through the um, analysis of the wording, the lexical expressions, and also the timing. So we, we have witnesses uh, a continuous increase of participation of all the local group's participants. Uh, moreover, we wanted to evaluate also the impact of Alameda local group with a survey uh, which demonstrated, as you can see, there is a general high level of engagement. But let me share with you a comment on the perceived impact on the research, which obtained a slightly lower rate, as you can see from, from the diagram. Well, this is a quite interesting output, uh, output, as it seems people with multiple sclerosis are submitting a call to action to the other stakeholders uh, in order to turn the passion voice and experience in a concrete impact for, for people with MS. Of course, the number of participants to this survey is, uh, is not big enough to draw conclusions. But um, we will uh, submit the same questionnaire again when the, the research goes on, and we expect a, a higher rate, since our aim is to secure a continuous involvement of the end users in, in the research. So let me conclude with a personal note on my, on my experience before um, closing my, my presentation. Um, my role is, of course, a person with MS and member of the ECT. Uh, I had the duty, but I want to say also the honor, to involve a representative community of people with similar experience in MS, uh, keeping the women to men ratio, which you know is peculiar for the multiple sclerosis, and guaranteeing also rep the representativeness of the target population, which in our case is relapsing re people with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis with typical onset between the age of 20 and 40 years. Moreover, the people enrolled are, comes from different areas of Italy and they are, they are all well interconnected with their communities. So um, this means that uh, we can, this allowed uh, to bring to the local group not only the voice of the six people involved, but also of a wider and more representative community. So giving content of validity to patients' voice. The ECT and the local community group uh, is the, are the start of this journey. So uh, the aim is to give prominence to the experiential knowledge of the disease, which is unique to patients in their closest careers. And here on the final slide, you can see our, pro our project contacts and you can follow us on our social network and see more information on the, on the website. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. We'll look really forward to how the project progresses and how the results come out. Thank you.
<clears throat> so now we're going to uh, turn to uh, getting a, an industry view um, on uh, a couple of key questions. Um, potential digital proms making patient input reliable, um, make measures domain, domain independent, uh, interdependencies possible. Is it a myth or reality? Um, Johan van Beek and Lucinio Acrovero are going to be online. I uh, hope we can uh, see them. Um, Johan van Beek is uh, Head of Medical Science and Digital Biomarkers at Biogen Digital Health. Um, in his role, he's focused on solving challenges for data science and digital technologies to transform how multiple sclerosis progression is measured and how health care is delivered to people with multiple sclerosis. Um, he's a neuroscientist and uh, has been involved in multiple um, companies over many years, including Serono, uh, Lundbeck, and Biogen. And Lucinio, he's a neurologist by background, uh, physician scientist, uh, scientific lead of medical affairs, MS Group in Roche, as well as for Floodlight. And uh, I'm going to hand over to Johan, who's going to uh, do a short presentation, and then we can uh, address some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. I hope you can uh, hear me okay. Um, so together Perfect. with my, my colleague, Licinio, we were tasked to address a pretty vast question in a very limited time, but uh, we've put together a few slides to hopefully fuel uh, a discussion that we believe is, is actually very, uh, very timely. Go to the next slide. So obviously the concept of leveraging technology to improve healthcare systems and patient management is not new. Um, but at the same time, one could argue that technology over the last decades has not significantly impacted the way care is being delivered to patients. N nevertheless, and importantly, the integration of technology has clearly significantly accelerated during the COVID pandemic. The, the crisis has, for instance, provided a unique opportunity to experiment with telehealth and evaluate its benefits and limitations in, uh, for instance, performing a remote neurological exam. What the pandemic has also truly accelerated is bringing all stakeholders together, healthcare professionals, patients, patient associations, scientific societies, regulators, and tech companies working together to establish guidance and frameworks for the implementation of telehealth in remote monitoring using biosensors and, and mobile devices. It's, it's also a fact, we have to recognize it, that patients themselves are increasingly becoming empowered consumers of healthcare with opportunities for them to manage their own health with wearables, mobile applications, and web pl platforms. Patients are clearly more and more engaged with their own disease, health, and, and wellness. Next slide, please. In, in fact, sensors embedded in wearable and mobile technology, especially consumer technology such as smartphones or smartwatches, have reached levels of accuracy enabling high resolution, precision, and sensitivity of measurements. It's, it's thus very plausible uh, and a plausible vision that in the future, objective patient-centric measurements of disease symptoms and progression can be remotely captured uh, through mobile technology actively or passively. So now we can discuss as to whether it is appropriate to call those measurements digital PROMs, but this is what this talk will uh, be focusing on, that is objective patient-centric digital outcome measurements that are indeed leveraging sensors that are found in technology tools, often consumer, consumer technology. Next slide, next slide, please. So, so tonight, we would like to focus on what we believe are three key success factors for digital outcome measurements to transform healthcare and potentially how patients are being monitored and managed. First and above all, uh, digital outcome measurements will require to be formally validated in clinical studies and in the therapeutic areas of, uh, of interest. Um, second, but also very important, is what we call consensus around digital outcome measurements. This is actually based on the fact that we are witnessing an exponential uh, proliferation of disease measurement tools. Um, just between 2015 and 2020, 
the number of digital health apps has increased by 500%. Uh, so consensus between key stakeholders on digital outcome measurements will be key in order to generate clinical value rather than fragmentation and more burden for the care teams. Last but not least, uh, what um, I call here ubiquity is very much focused on usability, acceptability of measurement tools. In, in other words, what are the potential drivers and barriers for patients, for instance, to use those tools? What is the value created for the different users and stakeholders for those tools to be broadly deployed in clinical research, also included in the context of real-world evidence generation and clinical practice? Next slide. So this is a rather complicated uh, slide, uh, but um, what, what I, I wanted here to outline uh, is that um, what we will need uh, is um, digital outcome measurements that are fit for purpose on one hand and formally validated. So I, I, I really summarize here the development cycle and validation strategy for digital instruments and outcome measurements. And you will notice that there is a close analogy with drug development pipelines or biomarker validation processes. Also very importantly, this specific development cycle is bringing together people with expertise spanning from technology, user interface, experienced designers, software developers, and to science experts like data scientists and clinical scientists. So, Initially, from concept to digital solution development, it is key that the concept of interest is clearly defined. What domain or function is required to be measured that is relevant to a given disease, and also so that it addresses a specific medical need and or disease measurement gap. So, for instance, let's say the remote monitoring of manual dexterity in a person with multiple sclerosis. The measurement instruments are then designed by the product software developers also using qualitative and quantitative user research. And if we consider those measurements uh, to be and become patient-centric, it is essential that patients' input is gathered early in the process to understand what concepts and aspects are the most important for them to measure, what constitutes, for instance, improvement. So, as an example, people with an MS that have their ambulation impacted may provide input that a very particular aspect of ambulation is most important and relevant compared with others. For instance, ease of walking, total distance walked, walking speed. And when prototyping the features, it is important to think about how the outcome assessed can truly be translated into describing how the patients feel or functions. The validation of the digital outcome measurements often include a cross-sectional evalu evaluation of the construct validity that uh, is actually investigating as to how the digital outcome measurements of interest relates to established clinical outcome assessments. So, for instance, how does drawing a shape on a smartphone touchscreen relate to the nine-hole PEC test? It's also being tested at this stage a number of important aspects pertaining to test retest reliability, day-to-day -day viability, inter-device viability, the test is administered across smartphone uh, models. The, the, the more challenging part I really want to highlight here is the longitudinal evalu evaluation of the clinical value of the digital outcome measurements. As the ultimate goal is not just to digitize established clinical outcome assessments, but rather validate measurements that are sensitive to change over time, that can, for instance, characterize clinically meaningful disease progression with more sensitivity. So they can also potentially become tools with predictive and prognostic value. This is truly the, the challenge that remains ahead of us. And I'm happy to discuss uh, this in the broader context of digital um, outcome measurement uh, validation. Next slide, please. So next is the consensus. Um, I think, as I mentioned, um, um, we are witnessing uh, an explosion of uh, digital uh, uh, measurement uh, instruments. So the, the real question is, do we really need more measures uh, or should we focus on trying to better understand the measures, clinical outcomes that, we, uh, that, are, that are now being uh, used and have been collected for decades? I, I would argue here that there is a unique opportunity, I believe, for technology to drive the development of more sensitive, objective, 
patient-centric measurements that may address the well-documented limitations of clinical outcomes and or uh, scales. The real problem uh, is this proliferation of measurement instruments that leads to fragmentation and confusion, uh, uh, really, uh, really speaking. And, and importantly as well, the perception that technology will add burden to clinical workflows and will potentially complicate rather than help clinical uh, uh, decision. So we believe that we have to acknowledge that many measurement tools will coexist in the future, but it is essential that consensus definitions of digital outcome measurements are being agreed upon to truly enable a consistent clinical interpretation, including uh, in clinical trials, um, towards driving the acceptance and adoption by healthcare providers. So, together with the LICINU, we can further speak to it if needed, but in a nutshell, uh, Bajan and, and, and Roche um, have uh, recognized this challenge and have entered in a pre-competitive research collaboration uh, that is uh, also open to academic and industry partners to develop a framework for the development of consensus definitions for digital outcome measurements in multiple sclerosis. Uh, this framework was presented as part of a poster at Ectrim's uh, last uh, year, with initial work focusing on the development of a concept of interest using the gate domain in MS as an example. Next slide. So, in, in, in order, obviously, uh, for those digital tools and digital outcome measurements to be broadly deployed in the context of clinical research and clinical practice once validated, uh, a key aspect, and this is really important, is to better understand drivers and barriers to remote data collection. In, in other words, if the focus is on patient-centric remote monitoring and data collection, have we properly addressed the following question? That is, will patients welcome the chance to take on a greater role in self-monitoring and self-management? What is and what will be the value for them uh, in it? I'm summarizing on this slide um, uh, a paper that was published uh, a couple of uh, years ago that uh, analyzed uh, eight uh, digital-only study, meaning that those studies did not include in-clinic visits but were rather piloting remote data collections through smartphone apps uh, in different disease conditions. Those are rather big studies, so you see there's a lot of data that are being contributed to, um, and they're really helpful because they truly help characterizing user engagement with respect to remote contribution to data. Um, the outcome of, of all those studies is rather sobering. I think it's very important we keep this uh, in mind. It highlights the gap that still exists between opportunities for long-term remote data collection um, and the reality uh, that is very much linked to acceptability, usability of those, uh, of those apps. In those studies, it was found that more than half of the participants uh, discontinued participation uh, within the first week of, 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 of a uh, study. What was quite interesting, nevertheless, is that distinct patterns in daily application usage behavior could uh, be uh, uh, somewhat uh, identified, including, for instance, very small proportions of uh, app super users. What I think also very important is that most of those studies were not able to recruit a sample that was representative of the race, ethnicity, of geograph geographical diversity of the US, all those studies were uh, having been con conducted in, in, in the US. Drivers of retention um, include pay for participation, so when patients are paid for data they contribute to, uh, clinical uh, referral, so um, it was um, noticed that if a clinician was recommending or prescribing the usage of an app Adherence on this app was much uh, better as compared with a patient, for instance, joining uh, by himself or herself a study uh, through a, a remote platform and through an electronic uh, consenting. In addition, and interestingly, retention on remote uh, data uh, uh, collection uh, is, is higher in older uh, patients. Um, younger patients seem to be more versatile and distracted by other digital offerings and were shown to drop uh, more often 
um, the, the, the usage of those apps in those uh, studies. So I, I, I think this is all in all an important observation um, that we have in those studies uh, bias in participant uh, recruitment and also combined with highly variable retention that can potentially impact the way we can generalize uh, the data that are uh, somewhat deriving from digital uh, studies. It also at the same time as we try to understand those usage behaviors offers the opportunity to develop engagement strategies to uh, indeed overcome those, uh, those biases. And next slide, I just would like to conclude uh, my discussion also in order to further fuel the discussion. Um, I would like to conclude with this slide that is summarizing the challenges and opportunities and towards best practices in personalized and digital medicine. Some I have addressed tonight, some not. While the promise of mobile technology is to enable the collection of large quantities of data, independent of time or place, potentially complementing in-clinic assessments, some challenges uh, remain clearly, including interpretability of the data, clinical meaningfulness of the potential changes observed uh, on those digital measurements, drivers and barriers to usage of those apps and remote collection um, uh, data tools uh, by patients is still largely unknown. And in general, as I just described, the attrition is, is very high, including in the context of, uh, of studies. Data privacy will be a topic of uh, discussion for, for sure. On, on the other hand, and also to, uh, to end this uh, talk on a positive note, um, I, I, I strongly believe that the technology is likely to increasingly integrate in patient journeys, potentially leading them to become more proactive about their disease, as well as within the healthcare ecosystems and workflows, uh, leading to true personalized management of patients, um, ultimately le leading to better uh, patient uh, outcomes and, and cost savings. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Johan. So this is uh, open for discussion. Has anyone got any questions from the floor? Maybe. Yes. Uh, may maybe a question and a comment to Rachel. Uh, maybe first of all, congratulations because I very impressive role of the uh, ECT. Very impressive, the major role you uh, the ECT have in the Alameda project, but at, even at the European level. So making telling it's possible uh, to have such involvement of uh, ECT. It's great to to see that. Uh, maybe a question also. I see it's three countries: Romania. Greece and Italy. Uh, maybe is there a specific reason for that? Because I don't know, because for Piero and so on, it's related to the maybe a common core of culture, Greek and uh, Latin origin. I don't know. Is there a specific reason or not? Well, uh, for, for these technical questions, I will refer to the, my colleagues here uh, who I'm sure will be happy to, to reply. I'm not, I don't know why those three countries have been uh, chosen for those three specific diseases, but that could be a very interesting question, actually, to see if there is any connection between disease and, uh, yeah, and, and, the, and the countries. So, but thank you very much for, for, your, for your suggestion and also for the compliments of my participation to ECT, which is my pleasure and my honor to, to be part of. Good. <clears throat> Thank you, Patrick. I think so, there is John Paolo. Yes. Yeah. You first. No, no, I'll need to, I'll need to go on. Go on. I'll need to comment uh, on uh, the question from Patrick. Uh, one reason is simply the fact that uh, this is the partnership of the European project that uh, that uh, we 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 build on the Alameda project. The, the other reason is to guarantee geographical differences. Let's say. Uh, so this is another reason. We have to take into account that we are talking about three different diseases. So also the way that we use measuring diseases is different among the three countries. And also, John Paolo, three different uh, questions, three different key research questions for, for the diseases. 
Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, both presentations. Very interesting. Uh, just a quick question to Johan. Um, how much time did the people have to use the app? And also the longitude, how long for? Because you said people dropped off quickly. Um, it helped them to get an, a monetary incentive. Um, how often do people need to do it? And how long does it take every day? Yep, so it very much depends on the on the studies. Uh, in, in general, what we see is that at least requiring patients to do tests uh, on a weekly basis is probably the best way to keep um, them doing tests. Um, it's a fair question. Uh, we don't have actually an answer on, depending on the tests, how frequently those tests need to be uh, performed. And I think this is going to be also key. So also for all those tests that are active tests, are um, not becoming too intrusive uh, in the life of, uh, of patients. This is truly something that we need to assess as we validate those uh, digital outcome uh, measurements. When, when it comes to um, length of the studies and duration of the studies, this is a little bit the problem that we're facing, especially with chronic diseases like multiple sclerosis. Actually, often um, the technology becomes obsolescent uh, much faster than the time it takes uh, to collect long-term patient trajectories. This is clearly, uh, clearly a, a challenge. And I think if we want to truly validate those uh, tools, that ultimately they provide significant digital biomarkers predictive of, of uh, disease progression, for instance, in MS, we will require actually uh, we will require years of uh, uh, patient trajectories to validate this. The question is, is that compatible with patients contributing remotely uh, to tests? This is the challenge. Yeah, I think that's a big challenge and definitely for the person using it because every week, I mean, would you do it yourself? That's always my first question. Yeah, give it a try and see how that goes. Okay, yes. thank you so much. Yes, Johan, uh, thank you very much for this uh, inspiring presentation. And building on the, our experience with Alameda approach it and uh, uh, you know, taking the advantages of this important pre-competitive collaboration between uh, Roche and Biogen, I think that uh, it would be welcome a, a efforts to engage patient uh, you know, in a scientific manner from the beginning of the development of all these different steps. And uh, I wonder if, uh, you know, Biogen or Roche has had, had additional thoughts about this uh, and whether, you know, we can collaborate also, call to, I mean, you know, a call to action to the other pharma that are part of, uh, you know, are part of PROMS in, in, a, in, a, in a scientific manner and uh, trying to engage them in a, you know, like we did for Alameda or uh, uh, like we are doing for PROMS, you know, in a, in a system, I mean, in a scientific Minor. So uh, I think uh, we we do it. Uh, Roche does it when they when they are developing uh, instruments um, uh, involving patients at the very beginning of the development of those instruments. Now um, I think what what you're saying is also very important, uh, being inclusive uh, and including patients in those um, rather consortium-like discussions in the pre-competitive pre uh, uh, space, like this consensus framework that, that we are developing, is definitely an idea that, uh, that we, should, uh, we should further uh, investigate, definitely. I'm all for it. Thank you, look forward. Um, maybe, just as an addition, maybe in any further systematic longitudinal evaluation type studies or validation, we could include a uh, are the engagement committee in, uh, in that. Yeah. <clears throat> We're coming very close to the end. Ernia? Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I would like also to add a comment that um, for adherence, it depends on the purpose for the app to be downloaded. If you do it for your own uh, checking, you will last very short. If you're paid for it, you will last, you will keep it longer. But if a physician is prescribing it to you, you will keep it for even longer. So maybe some disappointing results in research are not going to be replicated in real life. I think one final question, Robert. Thank you. Um, 
I, I can understand uh, very much the efforts of a pharma company or two pharma companies or a consortium uh, working in this area for the development of outcome measures that may be used in clinical trials, particularly in areas like progressive MS. From a patient point of view, it would be great if these techniques were also used in physical therapy, rehabilitation, etc. And for those, there are specific things that are activities of daily living that patients would like to be able to do with their lower extremities, for example. Not, uh, gait is obviously very important, walking, getting in and out of car, making a chair to bed, transfer, all of these things are captured in um, patient-contributed, patient-reported outcome. I'm just wondering how you see going forward the use of technologies like you're developing in the care setting, particularly with regard to physical therapy? Yeah. Uh, I think this is a great question. So I think to your point, uh, pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies are interested in, de in, in developing digital outcome measurements for the purpose of uh, enhancing uh, R&D. Um, I think we believe that including those uh, technologies in clinical development trials will enable us to better select patients, make better decisions, uh, and, 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 and so on. As, as you know, in the context of re rehabilitation, physical therapy, I'm, I'm a strong believer that this is also where measurements are as important, because re rehabilit rehabilitation only goes if you're able to measure uh, disease uh, and impact of the rehabilitation of the physical uh, exercise. Um, and this is clearly something that we are interested in. I think it's also fair to say that uh, uh, through the history of pharma, uh, the field of rehabilitation is something that we have been less interested in. But I think uh, with this avenue of um, digital um, uh, outcome measurements will come opportunities as well for, for pharma to start getting interested in, the, in this very specific space of physical therapy, rehabilitation and measurement uh, of improvement. Thank you, Robert. And thanks, Johan. Uh, just one final thing, Johan. Um, bridging from clinical trials to the real world arena, should they be done in parallel? Um, should we be transporting the findings from trials to real world? Um, do you have any comments on that? I truly believe they should be done in, uh, in parallel, right? Um, I think if you, if you wait, long-term patient trajectories to validate those measurements that will take far too long for, for, for those to be included in, in, uh, in real-world evidence generation efforts and also potentially in clinical practice. I think some neurologists may be interested in looking at patient trajectories on tests even if they are not validated. So there's the validation part that is important but there's as equally uh, uh, important uh, the usability and acceptability uh, parts. So I'm, I'm, I'm all for going uh, in parallel. So thank you very much. Thank you to all the speakers and a uh, very good session. And I'm gonna hand over now to Giancarlo, who's gonna finish up. Well, it was a very, very uh, interesting afternoon uh, because I'm just between the end of the meeting and before dinner, I am in a very critical condition, I have to say. Uh, but let's say very few words. The first one is that PROMS is the beginning, intended to be a multi-stakeholder uh, type of uh, action. And we abuse of this term multi-stakeholder, but in this case we can really see that this was characterized this afternoon, we had really the possibility to listen uh, to many different voices. The second point is just to, uh, to, to, just to list some of the words that recur today. Um, identification has been used a lot, uh, identification particularly, um, it has been arised the importance to try to identify something that we don't know until now. And I thought this was a very appropriate type of uh, concept. Uh, we need not only use uh, uh, 
uh, the new prompts or passive or active or whatever you like, but in order to confirm what we already know, but particularly to try to come up with something that we don't know. Then the standardization was again a very recurrent uh, word, and standardization is a problem, uh, but without standardization, uh, no one of the measures in prompts will be applied. So this is absolutely clear. Any type of measure has to work here and there, today and tomorrow. Without this type of aspect, it doesn't really work. Another fundamental word is collaboration. Collaboration is a, a fundamental step, col collaboration among the different stakeholders, but also collaboration uh, with the different MS centers. Uh, I think, again, we need to have much more uh, uh, attention paid to reinforce links and to try to move together, and not in isolation. Um, representativeness is, was another uh, type of uh, uh, word that uh, has recurred today. Uh, to me, this is extremely important. I just mentioned in my previous question how relevant it is that in uh, selecting the uh, patients, particularly, who contribute to define priorities, it's very important that we try to reproduce the complexity of uh, the uh, person with MS, because there is an incredible variability, and we should really try to do our best from this point of view. Then we heard, and this was very positive, from Team Cozzi, uh, the uh, open door from uh, uh, the FDA uh, concerning PROMS, and also uh, we heard from the, for the voice of uh, Ima that uh, even if there is not a very specific planning action from this point of view, but Elena told us that this is quite a reasonable type of uh, possible future initiative. And again, PROMS has to do its best in order to try to, uh, to uh, utilize such a possibility. Then we heard a lot about the present and future possibilities that the new technological tools may just uh, uh, give us. We had the uh, presentation of some very important initiatives like Almeida, Mobilize D, rather. I think what is fundamental here is really that we need to come up here with a very strong validation process. Uh, in this afternoon, we heard also from uh, the previous uh, type of meeting, uh, how relevant it is to, uh, to try to reach this type of consensus. And um, last but not least, uh, uh, it was very good to listen to the voice of the industry that was uh, really uh, uh, in, in full good uh, mood for collaborate with, uh, with PROMS. They are part of PROMS. They are a fundamental component of PROMS in the beginning. And it is a great value to try to, to come together because for the uh, future usability or, or validation, uh, it is very important that we consider uh, the clinical practice from one side, but also clinical trials from the other side. So uh, my last comment is about uh, uh, the people who have worked so heavily in these uh, two, three years. Um, first of all, I really want to thank uh, Paula and, and Patty because uh, what happened is due to the fact that we had a very intense collaboration. I have also to thank the Italian MS Society, the leading agency, because uh, uh, some work has been coming from the contribution here. And of course, uh, I think that peer will uh, be with me tonight in saying that uh, we uh, thank a lot the International Federation of Multiple Sclerosis and the European Shoko Foundation for again demonstrating that together we can work and we can be very productive. Thank you so much. And